Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special live stream um, from the Ontario Science Centre. My name is Laura Murray, and I work at the Science Centre. And today we're going to be chatting uh, about winter watch, because it is the season for winter. So <laughs> glad everyone can join us today, and we'd love to know where you're tuning in from. And uh, so I love talking about all the different seasons. My background is in wildlife biology and uh, ecology, so I love the seasons. And we have a special guest with us today from Science North. Amy Henson is joining us. Hi, Amy. Hi, Laura. It's so great to be here on this cold, wintry day from Northern Ontario. Well, it's wonderful that you can join us. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, it, about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a scientist here at Science North. Science North is located in Sudbury, which is about a four hour drive away from downtown Toronto. So if you ever make your way northwards, you'll be able to find us there. And I work in a whole bunch of different places in our science center, but my favorite place to work is definitely on the third floor where we have all of our animals. I'm a biologist and I love animals and I love nature just as much as you do, Laura. Oh, that's fabulous. And I know you've got great animals at, uh, at Science North. So that's so wonderful. And yeah, we're going to compare and share our experiences of winter uh, from about our positions 400 kilometers north. Um, our, our audience is watching from across Ontario on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia. I'm coming to you from the city of Toronto and acknowledge that the land I live and work on is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now also home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed with several Mississauga and Chippewa bands. I am very thankful for the stewardship of the land by our First Nations past and present. Caring for the land, all people and all life that depend on it is a shared responsibility and really begins with connecting and respecting nature. Do you want to share a little bit there, uh, Amy? Yeah, of course. Thank you for that. And I agree completely. From Sudbury here, we sit and are part of the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. And we here at uh, Science North are located on the traditional lands of the Atekamikshig Anishinaabe. And within the greater of Sudbury, greater city of Sudbury, though, we also reside on the traditional lands of the Wanapate First Nations. And we have many, of course, Métis people who live here as well. And we recognize, always recognize their cultural contributions to our region as well. That's so wonderful and I'm seeing in the chat that folks are tuning in from across the province. Um, I saw uh, Thorndale Public School and folks from Barrie, Highs from Toronto, from Hanover, Ontario. That's so great that everyone can, can join us. Now, um, so we're going to share our experiences of weather uh, in the winter and winter experiences, but Amy, could you maybe remind us why we even have winter in the four seasons? That is the best thing I think that's kind of in, so cool about our planet. So our planet, when as it rotates around the sun, it doesn't stand straight up and down like this. It actually has just a little bit of a tilt to it like this. So if our planet is moving around our sun, sometimes it's tilted away from the sun and sometimes it's tilted towards the sun. Now, if it's tilted towards the sun on our part of the planet, that's when we get all the great summer weather that we have. Our days are longer. It's usually warmer. And but if we're tilted oh, away from our planet like we are in the winter time, then that's when we get our shorter days. And that's when it gets a lot colder as well. So uh, it all depends on the tilt of our planet. And of course, where you live will also depend on the temperature. Sometimes you might live in a place that's warmer. Sometimes you might live in a place that's just a little colder. Yeah, and it's so interesting. You mentioned those sort of shorter days. Now, um, there's a special day at the towards the end of December called the winter solstice, and that's the shortest day of the year, but it's not the coldest day of the year, not usually. Right about now, this sort of end of January, beginning of February, is the coldest part of the winter usually, and that's because of how water hangs on to warmth from the sun uh, all through the summer, even into the fall and winter. And it's just now we're sort of reaching that coldest point. It's called the seasonal lag. And I think that's sort of interesting. 
And in fact, winter kind of arrived with a vengeance right here in Toronto just yesterday. So <laughs> up until now, it's been quite a warm, uh, warm winter. I'd say not very much snow. But one thing I love about winter is that it's sort of a quieter season in nature. Um, many plants and animals are kind of dormant or resting. They're conserving energy until the warmth of spring. But there's still lots to see and learn about. And I always think that the most important tool that scientists have is their power of observation. And mm -hmm. so Amy and I made some observations. So I'm going to tell you about things I saw on some winter walks. Now, as I said, it hasn't really been very wintry until yesterday when we got some snow. But one thing I noticed was um, the ground wasn't really frozen. Um, we've had very little snow. And in fact, I noticed some, um, some activity still in the soil. I'm going to hold this up so you can see it. This is an oak leaf that's got some holes in it. Um, and that tells me that there's still activity in the soil as small microorganisms, small critters, are returning these nutrients to the soil, getting ready for the next growth of spring. Uh, so nature's not completely asleep, even during the winter, and that's pretty interesting. But along with this, I noticed a strange sight just last week. So we've got a picture here that I'm going to share with you of what I think is a pretty unusual uh, sighting for Toronto in January. And this is something that I saw growing um i'm hoping we can pull up that photo and uh and show and show uh some of what i saw on a, on a walkabout in uh just last week in the winter i don't know if that's going to come up there but what i saw was tulips growing tulips um, yeah yeah that wait is not minute. wait yeah. a minute tulips don't start growing until like may and june around here <laughs> Well, basically, it's the same here. So that was very unusual. So um, tulips growing in the winter in January, not a normal sight. And with this snow and the cold weather we're about to get, I don't know that they're going to survive. But I also noticed some kind of unusual animal activity. We've also got a picture of this. I don't know if we're going to be able to show it. Um, and this is an animal that is so well adapted to its environment. And they live across Ontario. They are expert swimmers, and uh, normally they remain active, but they're under the ice. So if we've got that photo uh, to share um, of the uh, of the winter stump of the stump, um, there it is. Perfect. Um, so this animal, and if you know what animal has been working away at this, busy, you might say even. Um, this is unusual because normally there's a cover of ice uh, over ponds and lakes and these animals mm -hmm. are safe but active under the ice. So I don't know if anyone has some thoughts on, uh, on what animal we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. um, you can type it into the chat if you, if you have some thoughts on that. Uh, so that's, that's kind of unusual for, for me to have seen that kind of activity um, because there's no ice. So there's a lot more open water that I noticed. And open water is actually a great place to look for uh, for winter animals because it brings it brings those animals together. And I've seen things like herons and kingfishers, which normally would have gone south to find fish to eat. I see someone said beaver. Yep, that's oh, exactly they're, right. They're great um, answers, guys. Beavers. The beavers have been very active along the shoreline of uh, the city of Toronto. Um, but I've also noticed other animals. Some animals are getting ready to, to pair up and to mate. So things like owls, cardinals, um, squirrels are getting ready to mate because they actually have two litters of kits, they're called, um, in a year. So um, animals, some animals are actually quite active. And what I love about the winter is this looking for signs that animals are around. Because it's a quieter season, uh, you may not see the animals, but you can often find signs that animals are active. So I got a couple of things to show you here. I'm just going to bring this in close. And this is a goldenrod stem. And you can see that hole in the center of it, that kind of swelling and hole. And this is where um, an insect has laid a larva, a gall fly. And the hole tells me that a downy woodpecker actually found that. That would be a nice little morsel for a downy woodpecker mm -hmm. to snack on. So I didn't see the downy woodpecker or the or the larva of the fly, but I saw that they were around. And here's another one uh, that I'll share with you. 
So this animal, if you have some ideas about uh, what this animal might be, what this skull, mm -hmm. I'll show you the front view. Great big eyes on these guys, Great on the guys. sides of their heads. And that, that usually tells you something about um, whether it's a predator or prey. Mm. Um, I don't see any big canine teeth on there for ripping up meat. It all looks like they're molars. Yeah, in fact, it doesn't have any teeth at the front here, mm -hmm. which is sort of interesting. So um, if you have some ideas what this animal is, but bones, finding bones is a really interesting way to find out what's living around you. And in fact, bones are a good source of minerals and calcium for some smaller animals. You may see tooth marks on, on bones from things like mice and voles. When nutrients are hard to find in the winter, that's one of the things they can do. Now, that's pretty much it for my walk around. Amy, do you want to share what you um, found on your walks around in winter? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try to pop up our PowerPoint presentation just so that in our pictures, because I've got some really, really great photos that I want to share with everybody. That's great. Yeah, it'll just take me one second. Because yeah. I'm gonna make sure I know. do it right. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just looking at the chat. I saw someone said deer. Yes, that was a white-tailed deer skull. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and they are plant deer. specialists. Oh, they are definitely plant specialists. Um, there we go. And they're across Ontario, so that's an animal you can look for just about anywhere. Just about anywhere you get you go. Perfect. Oh, and I, I'm not quite sure if we can see my presentation pop up. There we go. Oh, here we go. I think it's coming. Excellent. That is fantastic. Great the stuff. The wonders of technology. The wonders. I know. This is great. And as long as we can still see it, right? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. So let me talk to you about these two photos because these photos are pretty much almost exactly what you saw, Laura. So I went for a little hike just in early January. And you can see even here in Northern Ontario, we've had a really strange winter. It hasn't been quite nearly as cold as it normally has been, except for today. Today is pretty darn cold. <laughs> But the ice on the lakes and ponds hadn't even frozen over yet. So the beavers were still out. They were super, super busy. And then if you take a look at the other photo that isn't the one with the tree cut down, you'll be able to see something that beavers make. It's their house. It's called a lodge, which is really neat. A lot of people think beavers live in their dams, but they actually build two kinds of structures, a dam to help build their pond, and then they'll build a house, their lodge. And right on the right-hand side of that picture in that lodge, you'll see there's a big pile of sticks that are sticking out from underneath the ice. And that big pile of sticks is something that they've been working really hard on. It's their food cache for the winter. So it's where they'll, during the fall, they'll cut down a whole bunch of trees, grab branches, and they'll build this little food pile for themselves. So that when the ice finally does freeze, they can still get underwater, grab food from their little food cache, and then they have food all winter long. So that was really neat to see. That's amazing. Yeah, beavers mm -hmm. are just incredible engineers of their environment. Uh, they are. Are. It's great Absolutely. that you, you have them there too. All right, now this is a little bit harder one for everybody. I'm curious if anybody could tell me what kind of animal this is. And Laura, if you can, if anybody's reporting in the chat, let me know. But this is an animal that um, here in Sudbury, people have been telling me that they've seen a lot of lately, especially since we haven't had as much snow as we normally had. Now, what's really interesting about this animal is that it is white. It's super amazingly camouflaged for the winter time because it'll camouflage in with the white snow. But in the summer, it's a different color. In the summer, it's brown. And I don't know if anybody's guessed this animal or what. I well, I love that. I see I see some some answers that are pretty close. Mm, so good. Um, and I love that this animal has two different names. It has a summer name and it has a winter name. Yeah. Someone so says weasel. Ferret, those are those are cousins to this animal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah. this is in the winter time we usually call this animal an ermine or an ermine, and in the summer we call him a short-tailed weasel. So there's all kinds of different names for this, but he is a carnivore. Definitely, um, you'll find him. And this person who I borrowed this from uh, from a person here in Sudbury, they found this guy in their garage. Go figure, right? Not very well in their garage. 
But my guess is he's eating some of the little rodents that might be sitting in that garage. So <laughs> Yeah, the weasels are amazing predators. And because they're long and skinny, they can go right down those mouse tunnels. And um, yeah, that's so great. That's a good one. So remember, so this guy, white in the winter, brown in the summer. Now there's something else that is also white in the winter and brown in the summer. And I found these tracks that were left behind. And these tracks, can anybody guess? I'll give you a hint. They are often have big feet and you can see their tracks have big feet for hopping along the snow, just like a pair of snowshoes. Yeah, I love it. It's yeah. so great. These animals are so well adapted to their environment. We don't have them here in Southern Ontario. Oh, so that's, that's pretty, pretty special. That's pretty special. And they are actually a snowshoe hair. So isn't that awesome? So snowshoe hairs in, yep. the, in the winter time have the same idea. They turn white and then they turn brown in the summer. So they camouflage really, really well into their environment, which is great. Yeah, and I love that they have those big kind of snowshoe mm -hmm. hind feet. You can see it in the tracks there, how their hind feet are really big, yeah. which allows them to skip along the surface of the water, surface of the snow, sorry, not yeah. the water, the snow. <laughs> <laughs> the snow yeah it's just and that's how snowshoes are designed too is that we used as humans we said hey that's a really good idea and made big feet for ourselves so that we don't sneak sink in the snow which is really great now i also saw my winter walk something really special laura and i really am excited to share this one with you they were these tracks and they're quite large they're very round and these tracks belong to an animal in Northern Ontario called a lynx, which is a type of cat, one of the wild cats that we have here in Ontario. And it's kind of neat because there were two sets of paw prints. So there were two lynx around, which was really wow. neat to see. And sometimes when I've been out on my winter walks, I have actually seen lynx tracks following snowshoe hair tracks because snowshoe hares are one of their favorite foods, especially in the winter time. It's one of their one of their primary food sources. So that was that was a really special find that morning. That's exciting. Yeah. And this is the last thing. Now, this isn't my photo, but I saw this while I was on my winter walk, but I was too far away to get a really good photo. But I know that I needed to share it with everybody because this, I think, is some of the weirdest looking snow tracks that you might see in the winter time. You kind of see there's a big kind of slush and then there's some dots and then a slush and then dots. And this is from a river otter. And what the otter is doing is that he's walking or hopping and then sliding across the ice on his belly. And so it's like a little slip and slide for them. And they slide it around and they hop a little bit more, get a little bit of speed and keep on sliding, which is really, really neat. So when you see tracks like this, they're really unique and definitely belong to a river otter. I love that. And it's kind of a way to conserve energy, right? It's like us. You're, let's say you're standing at the top of a hill. You want to get to the bottom. Do you toboggan down <laughs> or do you uh, walk down? Well, tobogganing down, way more fun for, for starters, but also uh, saves energy. So that's exactly what River Otters do. That's so great. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty envious of what you may have seen on your um, walk. But we both had this experience sort of at the beginning of the winter of it not being all that wintry. So um, some of you may think we don't actually need winter. Um, and if you have some ideas on why we do need winter, you can add it to the chat. Um, personally, I like all the seasons. I like the cold. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Toronto, fresh snow. The sun is sparking diamonds off the snow. I just love that, those crisp sunny days. And in fact, we do need winter. Um, ever since the ice sheets melted and retreated in Ontario, our whole natural system has evolved to have four seasons, including a good cold winter. We need mm -hmm. that. And so does everything else around us. Uh, in fact, there are plants that can't grow and create seeds unless they go through a period of cold. Um, Amy, I think you were trying to grow some uh, some native plants and you're you're putting them through their cold period, right? I am. So I love to plant native species in my garden to make sure that it's the right food for bugs and butterflies and animals and birds. And one of the things I'd love to do is start it from seed. It's a great place to, to start it. But 
you can't just plant them in the ground all the time. Sometimes they need to go through that cold period. So I've got a little stash of seeds right now in my freezer that they get a little bit cold. I put it, leave them in there for about five to six weeks and then I'll take them out in the spring and I'll plant them then. So yeah, they need that cold period. Otherwise, if I planted them in the ground right away, they, they wouldn't grow. Well, it's funny because I've got some seeds in my fridge too from Shagbark Hickory that I forgot to uh, leave outside. So I'm kind of trying to jumpstart them with a little bit of a cold, cold snap. So that's good. And plants being the basis of all our food chains, uh, we need those plants to do what they need to do to, uh, to flower and have pollen and all those things, uh, as you mentioned. So that's an important reason why we need winter. Absolutely. And even as harm, uh, as humans, we need we need winter here. Um, here in Southern Ontario, where a lot of crops are grown, the farmers need that cold winter snow um, because that becomes the source of water for the crops they're gonna plant in the spring. Um, it also helps to keep down pests. You may have heard of um, some, a disease called Lyme disease that's carried by ticks. Mm -hmm. A cold winter helps to kill off those ticks That's and true. other diseases and pests. So those are good reasons why we also uh, depend on having a, a layer or a season of cold. What about up in the north, Amy? So it's really important that we have a cold season. And just like all the animals that I talked about, they kind of depend on that cold season. But also a lot of our habitats where animals live, the places and spaces that they live in also rely on that cold season and especially getting a good amount of snow. So here in Northern Ontario, where we have lots and lots and lots of forest areas that are full of the boreal forest, so things like jack pine and um, birch and poplar trees, that forest really relies on having a good amount of snow every year so that it can help prevent forest fires in the spring. Forest fires, if we have a dry year that's hot, maybe doesn't have a lot of snow that year, or we have a quick melt with no rain or something like that, it can really cause a lot of the conditions that are hot and dry and the forest dries up, and then we can end up with forest fires that can be pretty dangerous, not only for us and animals, but um, but you know also some of the habitats. But here's the really cool thing about forest fires, Laura. Sometimes in Northern Ontario, forest fires are actually kind of a good thing because mm -hmm. our boreal forest relies to on small forest fires to keep the forest growing and to keep it alive. But we don't want forest fires to get out of control and hurt us, right? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, again, um, our, our whole natural systems have evolved with forest fires. They open um, mm -hmm. pockets in the forest. They allow different species to grow, different trees and plants and stuff, uh, create openings for animals. So there's a balance to be struck mm -hmm. there. And all of this balance has happened over thousands of years of evolution. Um, but it needs winter, it needs summer, it needs rain, it needs snow, it needs all these things to work. And another thing about... Um, the importance of winter is uh, I'm pretty sure we all like and need to drink water. And so we need that winter snow to help uh, fill up the rivers and the lakes and all that kind of thing. And here in Ontario, we use a lot of hydroelectricity, which is electricity generated from flowing water in rivers. And without uh, a good winter, uh, that could be um, that could be a problem. <laughs> and one of the really cool things I love is um, is that there's actually a special microhabitat that only exists in the winter between the ground and mm -hmm. the snow. And yeah. that's it. Has, this is so cool. And I think we've got a picture here yeah, um, that kind of shows about this because it's not a it's not a ecosystem that even exists in the summertime. And it's called the subnivian zone. Mm -hmm. And um, some of you may have heard of that before. Sub means under. Nives comes from the Latin word for snow. So it's this narrow band. And the ermines, like Amy has up her way, um, could exist here if they're chasing mice and stuff. So usually it's small mammal, mammals that find a spot where they're protected from cold, but also from predators. And without snow, they wouldn't exist. Oh, I know. And you know, that's subnivian zone. That's like where a lot of those little animals live. And I'll tell you, my dog, because we don't have a lot of snow right now, she has been so interested in what is lying under that snow layer. I think she can smell the little mice and little voles underneath. And she's been definitely sniffing a lot in our snow right now. 
That's so cool. She's tapping into her um, her fox and wolf ancestors yeah. to find out more. <laughs> now, animals have a lot of really specialized adaptations. Mammals in particular have, we talked about camouflage that they have, thicker winter coats, building up layers of fat, um, built-in snowshoes like the snowshoe hares. But I love talking about birds in the winter. And here's a couple of our um, iconic Canada geese. And I'm a bird watcher and winter in Toronto is a great place to see a lot of different winter ducks that I we don't see the rest of the time. But you, I'm wondering if anyone's noticed or thought about how do ducks keep their feet warm in the winter? Mm -hmm. um, here's a couple of uh, geese on, standing on ice in obviously what is very cold water because it's cold enough to have ice. Um, and if we tried to do that in our bare feet, Amy, have you ever stood on ice in your bare feet? I, I don't want to try it, Laura. I don't think that's a good idea. No, that's not idea. recommended because we <laughs> don't have this special adaptation that geese and ducks have. And what's really neat is it's another way to conserve energy. So warm blood from their core before it leaves their body transfers warmth from the blood to the colder blood that's returning from their cool feet. Now what's what's neat is that their feet and legs don't have a lot of muscle or blood flow. It's mostly tendons and bone, so they can get away with it. But um, even in that picture, you saw that one of the geese had one of its feet sort of tucked up into its feathers. It's conserving even more heat that way. And that's an amazing way that it can save energy. And really getting through winter is a lot about saving energy. So it's not um, a legged goose. No, it's not a one-legged goose, no. Um, not a special Southern Ontario breed of one-legged geese, no. Now, other things, speaking of birds, um, there's uh, there's a lot of amazing birds. If anyone has bird feeders at home and you want to share what birds you may have been seeing at your own backyard bird feeders, we'd love to know about it. Um, this is a very special bird. Um, well, it's a pretty special bird to me. It's called a white-winged crossbill, and you can see from the name exactly why it's called that. Um, and these are special seed specialists. They have this bill that is adapted to get into the nooks and crannies of a spruce cone. And sometimes when there isn't a big crop of those seeds in the boreal forest up where Amy is, they move south. There's huge movements of millions of these winter finches, as they're called, because there's other birds as well, evening grosbeaks and red poles and other things. Uh, pine siskums, I just said, so, I saw someone put yeah. in there, which is another one. And they move into southern Ontario and even into the U.S. Now, Amy, do you normally see things like white wing crossbills and yeah. other winter finches up your these, way in the winter? Yeah, these are really common species that we normally have that would come to my bird feeder. I love when the flocks of the finches come, you, they are red and yellow and you can you can see them. They're, they're beautiful. But this year's been weird. And I'm so interested to hear you say that because... I only have maybe three species of birds that I've seen at my feeder this year. I know we have chickadees, we have blue jays, and uh, and we've had a little nuthatch that's around as well. But right. that's it. Normally, I see finches. We'll have red poles and juncos and cross-billed finches, all kinds of woodpeckers. Somebody just mentioned woodpeckers. I often yeah. get woodpeckers as well. And this year, yeah, we just haven't seen them at all. Well, I think a lot of them are down here in Southern Ontario. So, <laughs> we saw um, the birds. <laughs> I know, and I've been a birder for a long time. I've never seen white wing crossbills in Toronto until this winter. So that's been yeah. very exciting. So very. animals go through these different phases. I've also noticed that um, we've got another picture here um, coming up, and this is a way that an another way for animals to conserve energy. Oh, there's a that's a good picture. Oh, that's that, one of your that's that's my bird feeder at home. So that's can, your backyard. Yeah, this is a this is a little special gift that I got from one of my little people in my life. And uh, but it is that is one of the ones the chickadees and my nut hatches love that little that little ball of seed. Well, maybe the white wing crossbills will come back uh, on their <laughs> way north again. So this is a spot where um, animals might hang out overnight. Uh, they don't necessarily go into a deep hibernation, but they just conserve energy overnight. Chickadees might roost up together. Raccoons might hang out here. Owls might hang out here. So they, again, this is a sign that animals are around. So it's something to look for. Mm. Um, you know, little pockets and cavities where other um, animals might be hanging out in the winter. And that's always, that's always a fun thing to look for. Absolutely. Um, so I think we can go back to full screen now. Now, 
Um, I mentioned hibernation, and um, that's one of the ways that animals, warm-blooded animals, have to survive winter. I know I saw a question about, um, I think it was about cold-blooded animals that that uh, surviving the winter, and they can't, they don't have feather or fur, um, so they have to do different things. And there's a couple of special names. One is about reptiles and frogs and stuff. What they do, if you know that name, you can pop it in the chat. And one is for insects, because they insects kind of go into suspended animation, just like that um, little larva that was in the goldenrod stem. They kind of are waiting it out. But warm-blooded animals have different ways of surviving. And um, there's some famous, there's some, I would say there's some famous animal hibernators uh, out there. And if you have some ideas about, uh, about what that is, because there's, there's actually a celebrity winter animal that even has its own day and it's coming up next week. I don't, Amy, do you have these animals up where you are? In, in um, the yes, we do. We don't see them as often as I think you see them down in Southern Ontario, especially through like the, uh, the fields and agricultural fields and farm fields that you would have down there. But I did have one living under my deck a few years ago. So I know they're around. <laughs> yes. And someone's mentioned hibernation and, and hibernation is kind of a, a place or a or a state that animals of a sort of medium size go into where they they really get um, they lower their breathing they lower their heart rate and they're really it's like a really deep sleep and someone I see has said groundhog a couple of people have said groundhog and yeah this the groundhog has become this whole winter uh, celebrity animal which I think is mm. is really interesting. So we actually have a quiz for everybody. So uh, sharpen your pencils. We got a quiz coming up um, because other animals have been used as weather forecasters. So um, mm -hmm. there's some pictures here. Take a look at what we've got. We've got a porcupine, groundhog, black bear, uh, badger, and hedgehog. Mm -hmm. So the question is, which of these animals have been asked for? And I that's in quotes. Um, their weather their winter weather predictions mostly about when spring is coming and um so if you have some answers about that we've got porcupine groundhog black bear hedgehog and badger mm. um and i'll give you a clue it's more than just the groundhog that's been consulted for its weather <laughs> predictions over time <laughs> And um, this actually is a tradition that goes back to Europe. And um, so the early early settlers to North America had a tradition where they would actually consult hedgehogs around about this time, what's called Candlemas Day, which is February the 2nd, same as Groundhog Day. <laughs> and they would decide then if they had enough candles for the rest of the year, how their um, amount, the amount of food they had left for their animals, whether they had enough firewood. It was a sort of a stock taking time. And uh, so hedgehogs were used there, but when they came to North America, we don't have hedgehogs. So they looked around to see what else was was around. And badgers were sometimes used as weather forecasters. And in Ontario, actually, it was black bears. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure about the wisdom of waking up a black bear, especially a mother black bear with maybe new cubs that she's feeding. Um, and kind of groundhog has become the one. now. Uh, so I see lots of answers here. I see um, someone did say hedgehogs and badgers and groundhogs. Yeah, all except except maybe that one on the left hand mm -hmm. upper left hand corner. What about that one, Amy? Well, the porcupine we have never really used as a as a, an animal that would tell us the weather. But I have to tell you, porcupines are one of my favorite, favorite animals. And we actually have a porcupine at Science North. And I know we've got a photo that's going to come up of our porcupine. That's great. Now, our porcupine is, her name is Maple. And Maple, even though she doesn't tell us the weather, she definitely reacts to the weather and probably reacts a lot, not only to the temperature, because she's indoors most of the time, but to the changing light. So she's reacting to how, how long the days are getting or how short they're getting. So you can see Maple on the left-hand side. There she's climbing her tree. This is summertime and she's really active. She'll be up and down her tree. She'll come out for walks with us. We'll be outside with her and uh, doing She's very, very active in the summer. But then as you see on the right, she's most spent most of her winter kind of curled up in a ball, hanging out in her tree. And 
she's not hibernating or anything like that. She will come down to eat and do things, but really the majority of her day is a much quieter time. She just hangs out there, kind of relaxes, conserves energy, really, really, really important, and kind of just gets a little bit more sleepier than she does in the springtime. So we know that winter is coming when Maple starts kind of hanging out in her tree a lot more than usual. That's so great. I, I wish I had a porcupine. I, I just, you know, I think that's great. Someone just said porcupines rock and I would have to agree. They are amazing. Um, and it's great that you get that, you get that sort of sneak peek even from Maple's activity in the mm -hmm. fall and how it kind of gets quieter. She's doing the smart thing, right? She's, <laughs> she needs to conserve her energy. And, um, you know, porcupines eat a lot of stuff like bark and needles, which doesn't have a lot of energy in it. So the more she can conserve, the better off she'll be. And I yeah. think that's I think that's great. Now, we talked a little bit about some of the reasons why we have winter and how it's evolved and animal adaptations. But what's happening is that climate change is affecting all these systems that used to work together so well after thousands of years. Um, these wild temperature fluctuations that we might be seeing can affect things like um, available drinking water that all of us depend on. Um, things like the fires you mentioned and maybe the drought uh, that comes along with that or that causes the fires. These interactions between predators and their pay, prey, the, the lynx and the snowshoe hare or the ermine and the mice. And if these things kind of get out of sync, that's when we're gonna see, that's when we were gonna see trouble. Um, so winter is a wonderful time to get out and about, and um, especially on a beautiful snowy day like it is here in Toronto. Um, I've seen lots of comments in the chat. It's kind of flying by so quickly. So if, uh, if we haven't had a chance to answer your questions so far, we will certainly do that um, even after the presentation. So no worries there. Um, I've seen lots of lots of comments saying the weasels are cute and the animals are cute. Yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to beat animals. Someone <laughs> had a pet hedgehog. That's pretty cool. Um, so uh, we'd like to uh, we're going to wrap up now. But if there's any last questions you want to get in there, we'd be happy to answer them. And um, if you're looking for more ideas of how to explore in winter, you can check out our online resources. Uh, we've got a backyard biodiversity bingo card that you can take on a winter walk, see what's up there, lots of signs you can look for. You can learn about some of these other winter wildlife survival strategies um, like hibernation and torpor, which is what uh, black bears do, not quite as deep asleep as a groundhog. <laughs> and then I think you can come home and make some animal track cookies, which sounds uh, fun and delicious, which That's I think is great. Um, and um, I want to thank Amy so much for joining us. I'm I'm quite jealous that you have lynx and snowshoe hare and river otters in your backyard. I have squirrels and I have lots of birds and that's good. But and, um, and you know what? In southern Ontario as well, down in Toronto, there are lots of different types of animals, and there are animals that live all around you, even within the city. So if you, I know that if you head down to the Rouge River and to Rouge River Park, there are all kinds of animals that are living down there, even close to the science center. It's true, actually. We do, the Science Center is on a ravine, so we get a lot of animals through there, even coyote and right. fox and yeah. possums and, you know, so there is stuff and it's always Perfect. fun to see that. So it's great to look for those things. Um, we want to thank everyone who joined us today from across the province, maybe even beyond. Um, and so mm -hmm. if you want to please like, comment, share and follow us on all our social channels, we'd love you to do that to find yeah. out uh, what's coming up. We'll have another Facebook live uh, live stream in two weeks from today, every other Wednesday at 2 p.m. Different topics all the time. And we'd love to know what you thought of today's event. Um, there'll be a survey appearing uh, in the chat. If you take a, just a couple of minutes to fill that out, we'd really appreciate it so we can keep these live streams going and improve it as we go. I think we've had lots of classes joining us today, which is so great. Um, and uh, and I hope that this is uh, food for thought for your next winter walk, wherever you may be. And um, I see one question here, do skunks hibernate? I'm just gonna answer that one. Um, skunks actually can group up in the winter time. Um, so they don't go into deep hibernation like groundhogs. They kind of go into a, 
light doze the whole time, but they can, when the weather warms up, they'll become active. And that's true for quite a few different animals. They take advantage when it warms up a bit and then they go back to sleep when it's a little bit colder. Yeah. So we, um, had, we had another question, Laura, which I'd love to answer because oh, yeah. another one of my favorite Northern Ontario animals. Somebody asked, do we have wolverines in Northern Ontario? Mm. And the answer to that is yes, we do have, nor have wolverines in Northern Ontario. They don't quite live uh, nearly as far south as Sudbury, but certainly when you go north there and, and certainly to the northwest, they do live in the boreal forest there and they're an extremely important predator within the boreal forest. So very cool question. And yes, look up wolverines because they're a neat animal. Well, and what's really cool about that, we've talked about a bunch of uh, weasels today, members of the weasel family. Um, the ermine is one. Mm -hmm. uh, skunks are one, river otters are one, mink are one, and so are fishers. So yeah. uh, weasels, the weasel family is a really interesting family of animals. Everything from these tiny little least weasels up to to wolverines and fishers. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all part of the same weasel family, which I think is really interesting. So uh, mm -hmm. I love that. We um, had another question that was about polar okay. bears. Polar bears, and, and I have to answer them because I love polar bears too. There are some certainly unique animals that live in Northern Ontario that don't live anywhere else. But we do have polar bears in Northern Ontario, but very far north in Ontario. So all the way up to the Hudson Bay coastline is where we can find polar bears. And so in the winter time, when the ice is frozen over, that's one of their best places where they can go hunting. They put holes in the ice or they'll use holes that are made by seals in the ice and that's where their main hunting grounds are so winter for a polar bear is like one of the greatest seasons of them all and that's they have lots to eat they ha do a lot of hunting and they live on the ice pack there up up around Hudson Bay and then of course throughout the rest of northern Canada as well well and they're they're like a pure winter animal mm -hmm. um because they really need ice and snow to survive without it they are going to be in real trouble and they their fur color that they keep that all year round so they don't change because they're always on snow or ice so that's a real requirement <laughs> um i said there was another question that i saw about do ducks hibernate and ducks do not hibernate um no birds hibernate but they um they ducks are amazing because they can uh, they can find food just about anywhere and um, we have a lot of interesting ducks that come here for the winter that I don't see the rest of the year. So animals really are um, amazing in the way that they've adapted to the environment that they find themselves in. I see another question here: What determines what type of a shelter an animal will hibernate in? That's a good question. It's it needs to be snug. It needs to be warm. Um, sometimes they excavate it like groundhogs are excellent diggers. So they create their own spots to hibernate in. Some animals may just use, um, things like cavities and trees that woodpeckers have created, but they just take advantage of that. So kind of depends on what type of animal, but, um, it's pretty interesting to learn, to learn more about that. So I think we're just about out of time. And um, we love that you've added, asked all these questions. We're gonna get to all the questions, um, if not now, then later. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today and uh, get outside and uh, see what winter has to offer. There's, there's lots of amazing things to see. And again, I wanna thank Amy for uh, sharing all her, uh, her winter wildlife uh, wonder that she saw yeah. up uh, up in Sudbury. That was great to hear about. Yes, thank you, merci, miigwech. Thank you for having me. I can't tell you how much fun this was. That was so great. Well, thanks everyone and um, have a